Devil is on his way. Devil is on his way, motherfucker. Oh, the devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Fall to your knees. Devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Motherfucking knees. Are- Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Some content may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. We say fuck a lot. Hey y'all, welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. I thought you were changing your name. Oh yeah. <laughs> Chainsaw Charlie. Chainsaw Charlie. Isn't that your new name? Hey, nothing can stop me. Or when you whack that leg off, we're going to start calling you Peg Leg Packer. Yeah, to those who don't know and don't follow some of our social medias, I injured myself with a chainsaw. R.I.P. to Dylan's ego. Yeah, it's pretty embarrassing. Was it? I, I well, like... you have to fill the folks in on what happened, Dylan. So I was working on a fence. I do fences on the side. Shout out to Accurate Fence. If you're anywhere in the region, I will do it for you. Um, and I won't injure myself on your property, I promise. But anyway, I was working on a side fence. And um, I mean, I don't know what to say. I was using a big chainsaw and I cut myself across the knee. Just lost control of the chainsaw? You lost <laughs> positive control of your item? I lost control of the tool that I was using and I injured myself with it. And I don't think it's funny. I'll tell you what's not funny, Dylan. <laughs> this motherfucker, y'all, let me tell y'all about oh, him. No. Okay, he calls me, right? Freaking out on the phone. Baby, I've been hurt. You got to come get me. And then just fucking hangs up. No, I've been hurt real bad. That's what you said. And then you just hung the phone up. Yeah. Um, One, I had no idea where you were. I knew the street name because you had mentioned the house on blah, blah, blah street. But I had no idea where this house was. I didn't know anything. You had me so scared. I thought you had like cut yourself in half, that you had nail gunned like a board to your brain. I did not know. Yeah, I don't think nails can penetrate this head. But no, I'm sorry, I did not mean to scare you, but I just wanted my wife. I was hurt, and I was crying, and I just wanted my wife. You scared the shit out of me, and bro. I, I, <laughs> I was so scared. In hindsight, I could have handled that a little bit better. Communicated a little yes. bit better? Yeah, I think yes. so. But I am okay now. I had a great doctor at the ER there. He sewed me right up. I did not cut my leg off or anything like that. Thank goodness. And uh, yeah, my my knee. It could have been so much worse. It could have been so much. I mean, worse. let's be honest. Considering it was a chainsaw, a big ass chainsaw, that's a pretty superficial wound <laughs> for a chainsaw. Yeah, considering I, I, I mean, made contact with it, basically running wide open. Um, and, and now that I'm on the other side of it, I'm healing up. I'm I feel lucky, but I still hurt myself with my own tool. So you know. It'll take a long time to recover from that. Your poor ego. My confidence is not very good right now. I know. That's why I'm using every opportunity to drag you. Thank you. Just kidding. No, but since this happened, now do you have more sympathy for Leatherface's victims? Oh, I do. Oh, my God. Because that's a pretty gnarly laceration. Puncture? I'm not sure what exactly you would call these wounds. But they're pretty radical. Yeah, I've got to say, I've always wondered, you know, using a saw, being around one a lot over the years and seeing movies um, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, what it would be like if the chain made contact with you. And so now I know. It just like rips your skin open. It's not cool. It's not okay. And it's as bad as you think it's going to be. And I barely got licked by her. Woo. I couldn't imagine someone leaning into it. There's a Ric Flair woo up in here. Oh, my gosh. So, well, not, Dylan, I'm glad you're okay. I'm okay. And thank thank you to all our listeners and anyone on social media who gave me well wishes. Uh, yeah, they patched me back together, and I'll be better than ever. Yeah, I was going to say, folks, if you want to check out Dylan's gnarly leg, we posted some photos on Instagram. <laughs> you can check that out if you want to. Is it that bad that while I'm not sure what's happened to me, I'm just like take pictures and share it with anyone who wants to see it? No, I was fascinated. When the guy was sewing you up, I was like totally into it. Yeah, and I was like. But then now that you've been sewn, I'm just sort of disgusted by your scabs. I'll be honest. They kind of grossed me out. 
Yeah. <laughs> the fleshy, bleeding wound was like, whoa, yeah, cool, yeah. But then now that you've got this, like, scab, I'm just like, ew. You won't help me pick my scabs? Get your scab away from me. Okay. So on a lighter note, I would like to thank today's sponsor of Mountain Murders, Kelly, for so generously donating at Patreon. Yeah, thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Now Dylan can afford to buy a beer to ease his pain and suffering. Ah, it's okay. I'm actually surprised that you haven't milked this injury more. Because when you're sick, you're a little bitch. That's true. You're the biggest crybaby in the world when you're sick. So I really thought, oh my gosh, he's going to be down for the count. I'm going to have weeks of Dylan being like, oh, it weighed on me. I'm pitiful. Well, You've really not been like that, so thank you. Well, it's... um. Uh, <laughs> I cut myself, <laughs> and it did. Uh, I must say, as shook up my confidence, because I, I mean, I'm the chainsaw. You're shooka? I'm the chainsaw guy. Uh, other people work in close proximity to me, running a chainsaw because they know and they've seen over years and years of my proficiency with a chainsaw. And then I fucked around See, and cut you're just myself. Being cocky. No, I'm not. You have to respect the chainsaw. Don't I've I? been humbled, and I made a safety post on Facebook about my injury. And the lack thereof of PPE. Yeah, you need some protective gear. And you can never be overconfident, and complacency is the first step to getting your hurt. Your company, your business needs to invest in some Kevlar pants. Yeah, I'm going to get some chainsaw chaps, but then I'm never going to wear them. Why? Because I'm a badass. <laughs> badass who just about gnawed his leg off. <laughs> no, I'm probably going to wear them now. You definitely should. Okay, enough about that. And uh, so here we are. Here we are. We've had a lot yeah, going well, on. Yeah, well, I kind of wanted to bring that up because we have been a little late this week with episodes. We missed our midweek. Damn it. It was going to be such a good midweek. Well, until you sawed off your leg. Oh, and then uh, we've missed Batshit Crazy as well. So we're trying to get back to it. We've had a hectic week. A lot happening. Uh, I mean, aside from Dylan's chainsaw incident. So, yeah, we're we're ready to get back to it. We are back. Thank and you we're... for your patience. Yes, thank you very much. And we are glad to be back. And I'm sure Heather has a wonderful story for us, as usual, today. Well, Dylan, for those of us who also follow us on social media, once again, I'm going to plug that social media, uh, Instagram, Twitter. We made an announcement that for the next year, basically, we're going to be covering cases related to certain geographic areas uh, per month, if that makes sense. I'm probably not articulating that in the best way. It's late. Um, but each month we'll be covering cases from a specific state. Ooh. So April, since we are now into the month of April, we will be covering cases out of New England. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Right. So yes. are you ready? I'm ready. Let's just get straight into it. Okay. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Cheshire, Connecticut, Dylan. It's an idyllic little town in central Connecticut with a population of around 29,000 and a median income of $80,466, which is a pretty decent income median. Yeah, that's not bad. It's more than our median income in, in our area, for sure. It's like <laughs> triple that. Let's see. It's an upper middle class kind of town, but with a good bit of ethnic diversity. It lies about 14 miles of New Haven. Um, and if New Haven sounds familiar, that is where the famed Yale University is located. Oh, my God. I never knew where Yale was at. You didn't know? No, I just knew it was up that way. It's up that way. Yeah. And it's about 25 miles south of Hartford. Cheshire was once a market town for farmers, but by modern times had become a place for professionals and business people who worked in the city and wanted a, a decent commuting distance um, to live out in the suburbs. There were houses more than 200 years old. Um, that are peppered with these new subdivisions, which kind of cropped up in these once open fields. Uh, but that's kind of a strange mix. You have all these really old houses, probably have a lot of character, you know, interesting yeah, architecture. Those old New England houses are gorgeous. Yeah, and then you have some cookie cutter McMansions, uh, you know, right next door in a field. The little salt box colonials and whatnot. It's just, um, it's a really beautiful area, New England. And you've never been, I would love to take you. Up, up that way, as you Baby. say, one day. I think you would like it. It's really pretty. I want you to take me in New England. <sighs> I thought you were going to cut out the, the creepiness. That's not creepy. It's, I'm your wife, and it's creeping me out now. Well, that's a, a win. 
Yeah. Keep your scabby leg away from me. <laughs> Baby, okay? I'm going to scratch your back with my scabs. Ew. <laughs> Gross. Okay. So uh, so you have this interesting place, kind of a mixture of old, new money, right? Yes. You think so? And uh, old, new houses. All right. I'm just, picturing it. Just a beautiful little small town, right? Picture-esque, postcard-like. Right. So basically I'm describing really nice, quiet, suburban town set the scene for you. Dr. William Pettit, a leading authority on the treatment of diabetes, lived in a lovely house on the corner of Sorghum Mill Drive and Hotchkiss Ridge with his wife, Jennifer, and two daughters, Haley, nicknamed Hayes, and Michaela, whose nickname was KK. I like those nicknames. Bill, as he was known, had lived a charmed life. He grew up in Plainville, Connecticut, where his father owned a general store and was president of the Rotary Club. Bill had been a standout high school basketball player who attended Dartmouth, graduating cum laude. Very smart guy. Is that like top of your class? Yeah, that's with honors. Okay. And, of course, Dartmouth is... Oh, you know, one of those very well-renowned, I mean, we mentioned Yale University at the beginning of the episode. Dartmouth is one of those very prestigious, well-renowned schools, uh, probably considered Ivy League. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. He studied medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. And by the time he was in his third year of medical school, he met Jennifer Hawk, a nurse at the Children's Hospital. Their shared interest in healing helped the couple's romance blossom. Jennifer's father was a pastor in Meadville, Pennsylvania, and when Dr. Pettit received a fellowship at Yale, the couple moved to Brantford, Connecticut, where Jennifer took up a job as a medicine nurse at the university, and she quickly rose through the ranks there. She was soon the head nurse on the pediatric floor. In 1989, Jennifer became pregnant with Haley, and the couple decided to move to Cheshire. Wow, they sound like uh, we've talked about these types of couples before. They're both driven. Highly motivated. Highly intelligent, it seems. And, uh, yeah. Young, upwardly mobile professionals. (laughs) That doesn't describe us, does it, baby? (laughs) No. No, we've, like, plateaued Uh, as far as success somewhere down around the bottom. That's okay. Bill had a successful practice. You know, baby, we're rich in love. That's true. Bill had a successful practice in his hometown of Plainville, as well as was the medical director of a diabetes center in town. And director of the endocrinology, metabolism, and diabetes um, at the Hospital of Central Connecticut. So this guy, I mean, he's got a lot going on. They were described as a wonderful family who hosted guests quite often. They were warm, thoughtful, and active family. The Pettit family spent a lot of time volunteering and raising money for multiple sclerosis, which Jennifer had been diagnosed with about eight years before her story takes place. Wow. So she had MS. Haley captained a fundraising team that managed to raise $55,000 for MS research over a seven-year period of time. So little girl wanting to help her mom out, wants to do something good, ends up raising $55,000. I mean, that's a lot of money. Well, that's amazing. Isn't it? It was on Sunday, July 22nd of 2007 that Dr. Pettit was able to spend time with family. He played a round of golf, 18 holes, with his father earlier in the day. And the girls had gotten in a swim at a beach club where they were members. Jennifer, uh, she was an attractive blonde, middle-aged woman. And her 11-year-old daughter, Michaela, were wearing shorts because the temperatures were in the 80s. And that's when the pair went into the Super Stop and Shop, which is a huge grocery store at the Maple Court Shopping Plaza. Though stunning, Jennifer was modest, and she spent her life helping others. And not only was she an excellent mother, but Jennifer worked as a nurse at the town's boarding school at this time. For the past eight years, as I mentioned, she had been battling MS, but by all outward appearances, no one would suspect that she was ill, because she did present as a very attractive, you know, well-groomed, manicured type of lady. She was so clean. Just picturesque, you know, (laughs) beautiful. I mean, you could look at this woman and tell, like, she came from money or she had money. So she didn't advertise that she had MS. She dealt with it kind of privately, it sounds like. Yes. Okay. Michaela was also an adorable preteen. 
And on this particular evening, she'd been tasked with preparing dinner for her family, the reason they had gone to the grocery store. The mother and daughter carried out grocery bags, loaded them into a white Pacifica, like minivan. The women were completely unaware that they'd attracted the unwanted attention of a boogeyman. Oh my, this is just like we were talking about the other day with that poor woman who had snatched from a Walmart parking lot. You know, you just never know who's watching you, right? Right, and this creep, and we're going to get into this creepy guy, this boogeyman as I have described him. I mean, he's the damn devil. I'm just going to say that. And he was immediately attracted to this pretty mom and her beautiful little girl, both blondes, both wearing shorts, and he just got the wrong idea. Oh, my God. Michaela considered herself a budding young chef. Often, she watched the Food Network and was known for making delicious vegetarian meals. On this Sunday evening, Michaela prepared a pasta dish with homemade sauce using fresh tomatoes, garlic, olive oil, and basil. She also mixed up some balsamic vinaigrette for the salad. Being younger and less athletic of the two girls... Michaela was definitely her like a mama's girl, while her older sister Haley seemed closer with her dad. Wow, how do you get your kids to make fresh meals with fantastic ingredients? <laughs> well, Haley was the athletic child. She rode on her high school crew team and played basketball. From the age of 18 months, her father had taken her to basketball games. Um, he loved to go to the University of Connecticut to UConn games and would always take his young daughter with him. They were often seen in the driveway, running drills and shooting hoops. She was also the co-editor of her high school literary magazine. Haley had recently had her own health issues when she was hospitalized with a collapsed lung just before her graduation. Oh, wow. That's a serious issue. Haley wanted to be a doctor just like her dad. She loved Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Do you remember that TV show? Oh, I certainly do. I never watched that. I didn't watch it, but I knew people that did, and I don't know for whatever reason the name stuck out in my head. Well, she even suggested that her baby sister be named Michaela after the lead character, Michaela Quinn. So she's a big fan. Haley was accepted at Dartmouth College, early admission, just like her dad. She had attended the Miss Porter School in Farmington, which was a private all-girls school, from what I've read and, you know, through my research, a, a prestigious all-girls academy. Bill and Jennifer were very proud of their two daughters. After having enjoyed a lovely dinner, both girls read Harry Potter that night. Haley was finishing the last book while Michaela had just begun the first book, just begun the first book. So a man watched as this white car pulled into the Deaconwood neighborhood and parked in front of a luxurious beige clapboard colonial on the corner lot. This house had to be at least worth half a million dollars. So he's followed these women home from the grocery store and he is parked in front of their house and he's watching. Oh, that's so scary. It's very scary. Now, I hope I'm not butchering his name. I even looked up how you say it. His name is Joshua Komisarjevsky. Oh, so this is the bad guy, right? Yes. Yeah, well, so fuck we're gonna him. get into him. Um, I'll be calling him Joshua just because Komisarjevsky is a name I probably will end up butchering a million times. So we're gonna call him Joshua. Or shitbird. Or shitbird. He met Stephen Hayes in a halfway house in 2006. Now, in 2004, Hayes had smashed a car window with a rock and stole a woman's purse. But his criminal record began at age 16, and over the years since his first arrest in 1980, Stephen Hayes had been arrested 30 times. He was also a crack addict. So it sounds like mo- probably mostly petty crimes, dumb petty thefts, and drunken disorderlies, just dumb knucklehead stuff, right? Yeah, pretty much. Recently, Hayes had asked Commissar Jeffsky to help him with a job. So Hayes had been living with his mother as part of his probation, but needed to find a place to live. As far as Joshua knew, Stephen Hayes was clean and sober, but the money he had saved to buy a truck went up in smoke. Literally. Yeah. Stephen Hayes had to move out. His mother was like, you know, you're not going to be using crack, smoking crack in my house. You have to leave. So he had a very short window of time that he needed to get out and find a place to live because, again, he's on probation. 
has to have a stable place to live. Yeah, and I'm sure it's not the first time his mom's dealt with this tomfoolery. She's probably just had enough of it. Yeah. He's like, you're once again, you're not doing the right thing, so just clear out. So the men plotted to break into a home and steal some, steal some shit, basically. Uh, hit a lick, as I learned uh, in one of our other podcast episodes. Yeah, you got to hit a lick. Got to hit a lick. It's a comeuppance. Now, Joshua, let's talk about him a little bit. He was born in 1980 and spent most of his life living in Cheshire. He was adopted a few days after his teenage mother gave birth to him. He worked for a roofing company out of East Hartford and did some contracting work on the side. And though by appearances he seemed like any working man, Joshua had a lengthy criminal record. He was known to Cheshire police only a few days before the, the day in question, this particular summer day. He had removed the ankle monitoring bracelet, which was part of his parole agreement. He had served four and a half years of a nine-year sentence for multiple home burglaries. He would still be on parole until August of 2013. Though he had newfound freedom, Joshua had already violated his probation in multiple ways. He had only recently gotten custody of his five-year-old daughter, Jada, who was often in the care of his mother. Joshua also had a, he had a thing, Dylan, for underage girls. That's never, that's never a good thing. Right, it's not gonna. It's only gonna lead to trouble, and exploitation of young people. So it's just not. It's not okay. No, he's a real shitbird. Now his current girlfriend was only sixteen, and his baby mama had only been sixteen when he impregnated her at age twenty-two. Gosh, you know, you know, sometimes these pa- parents of these younger children, young women typically, um, are okay with like some twenty-some-year-old you know, dating, as they call it, they're a 15 or 16-year-old. And that's just not okay in any... It's it's so bizarre to me. I mean, I've discussed this at length on the podcast, but I grew up in a very sheltered type of situation. But I remember being in, like, middle school, like in the eighth grade. So you're, what, like 13? Maybe 14? Yeah. Maybe. And there were girls my age who were dating grown-ass men. You know, typically, I think it's a cyclical thing, um, uh, cyclical generational trauma, whatever you want to call it. Uh, The mom may have dated someone much older when they were younger, you know, didn't want to listen to their parents, whatever, run around being a little badass. I I think a lot of times that's how it happens. And then when they have kids... They don't see it as... They're like, well, I was doing the same thing at her age. It's yeah. not a big deal. Like, is I'll, that what you mean? Yeah, almost like some just of, some weird justification to, well, I did it and, you know, I'm okay, but they're probably not really okay. Well, I mean, I remember some of those girls were probably very likely sneaking around seeing an older boy. Oh, yeah. Or a grown-ass man. Um, but a lot of these girls, I remember their parents knowing about it and being okay with it. I've told you a story before about being in like the eighth grade and working on a class project. We had to build a lighthouse, like a North Carolina lighthouse. Yeah. Big deal. Whatevs. And this girl who was my partner brought over her boyfriend to pick her up and his buddy. And they were like in their 20s. And she was trying to like introduce me to his friend. Oh, my God. Oh, he's single. And the dude's like 23 or something. And what are you like, 13 or 14? Yeah, and my mama was not having it. My mama was like, mm-mm, no. Who are these grown-ass men in my house? They need to leave. Well, and I couldn't imagine you were thought it was a cool thing. I was weirded out by it. Right. Because I was very awkward. I mean, I'll be honest, I was still playing with Barbies when I was like 13. So I was like, a boy, a grown man, ew. Ew, gross. Yeah. Okay. So weird, right? So he's like a pervert. He's dating these young-ass girls and... We'll get into him. He's just, he's gross. Well, Joshua had a history of mental illness as well as being admitted to Elmcrest Psychiatric Hospital at age 14. His parents were fervent Christians who thought prayer was the answer to their son's problems, but had to go along with this court directive to admit their son to this hospital. Eventually, they took him out of this program and put him in what they called uh, faith-based treatment. (laughs) Faith-based. Faith, I will get him out. Faith-based treatment. And after that, he had a history of suicide attempts. But they're refusing to give him any kind of medication. 
So they're strictly sticking to their religious beliefs, and they think their church can help him. Yes. Or a church program of some sort. Yeah, and it's my understanding as well that, you know, Joshua, I'm not going to say like he grew up with a lot of money, but they lived on some family property that was like acres of farmland. His mother was a librarian. I believe his father was, you know, kind of a blue class but blue collar working class kind of guy. But it sounds like they lived in this really like nice big old house on family property. And, you know, he, so he grew up with a little money, pretty middle class kind of guy. I mean, decent life. Yeah. Um, and but, these are his adoptive parents, yeah. correct? But then just had this, you know, this history of mental illness and uh, criminal behaviors that, that came after. Well, see, I would always be worried if I did adopt because some of this stuff is hereditary and issues do arise, I would always in the back of my mind be worried, maybe. I mean, you know, you worry about your children even if they're your own you're children. You're adopting the bad seed. Well, well, yeah, I would think that maybe. But just, you know, what's going to happen? You know, what was the rest of their family like? You know, and even health issues. What, you know, cancer around their family, heart issues. So I don't know. But I think it's a great thing that people do adopt and can adopt. So let's get back to the afternoon when Joshua spots this mother and daughter. He sat in a red Chevy Venture parked in the shop and stop parking lot, smoking camels, and was waiting for a contractor to pay him. He had spent the weekend working on a renovation, and when he took the job, he was supposed to have a crew to help, but they had not shown up. It was there that he spotted the blondes in the white Pacifica and followed them home. As he watched the women carrying in groceries, his cell phone alerted. It was Stephen Hayes. The pair had spent the night before cruising around Cheshire looking for a house to burglarize, which they found, and I'll get to that in a minute. On the other end, Hayes asked, have you found another house yet? To which Joshua said, I think so. Now, the pair were unlikely friends with opposing personalities. Hayes was called Uncle Fester by the people in the halfway house. Because he looked like Uncle Fester. Okay, so he had a bit of a, a, a bit of an odd look. He's got the the completely bald head. Big ears. I'll just say he's got a unique look, Dylan. Okay. He was loud, obnoxious, joked around a lot. People said he was a pervert, was kind of always making sex jokes. Sounds like somebody else I'm sitting across from right now. Oh no. God, no. Hayes was a back-slapping jokester. He had gotten his GED while he was in prison. And Commissar Jeffsky was quiet, intelligent. People said he, you know, seemed like a total gentleman when you met him. Acted like he had some sense about him. I think, and I think he would be the more dangerous of the two, you know. Someone you may actually think is a good guy, you know, kind of trick you. Well, I think that's the case here, Dylan. So on Saturday night, um, as I said, I would get into the story. So on Saturday night, Joshua and Stephen parked the venture in a condo complex off of Country Club Road. The men were quiet, nervous as they came up from around the back of the Bergamo house. A trek through the woods led them to the family's backyard Joshua told Stephen to wait in the tree line while he threw a towel over the motion detector. A window had been left open, so in a matter of a few seconds, Joshua was in the house waving Stephen to enter through the back door. Now, according to news stories, there were five people upstairs asleep. The burglars went through the drawers, closets. Joshua had purchased a BB gun, like pistol, from a sporting goods store earlier in the day. He had also picked up plastic zip ties. Hayes took a carving knife from one of the kitchen drawers. It was when they heard a car pull up that the pair got freaked out. And Joshua remembered that prom was being held that night and considered it might be one of the family's like older kids returning from the prom. He didn't know what it was. So they've come com totally prepared to burgl burgle this house. And if they come across anybody, to subdue them and tie them up. Yeah. They quickly left the house out of the back door. The takeaway from the Bergamo house was thin. They got about $140 in cash. 
After they left the Bergamo house, the pair went to Glenbrook Drive, where a man named David Hicks lived. Joshua walked right through the back door. Because again, this is like a small-ish town, suburban. People still feel relatively safe leaving their doors and windows open. So the whole reason they commute, they get out of the city, it's safer, quiet neighborhoods. Loosen up those buttons a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't have to have the six locks on your door. Exactly. They found credit cards, cash, and a cell phone. The men eventually took a family portrait. That's weird. Well, Joshua would later say it was just to fuck with the family. Okay. Well, that would be disturbing. If you're going through things that are missing, you're going to expect, you know, your your small valuables to be gone and stuff like that. But then your family portrait? I would just be like, what the hell? Well, I I feel like this is unsettling for a number of reasons. One, if someone takes your family portrait, they know what you look like. They've been in your house. It's a complete violation of your your sanctuary, your personal space, right? So that's freaky. Then when you actually find out about this guy, he's a fucking pervert. Yeah. Joshua, he's a creep. He could be looking at it. Yeah. Oh, my God. Especially if you have, like, young daughters or something. Oh, Jesus. Because he's a fucking weirdo. You're right. That is unsettling on many levels. But in the end, it wasn't much more than what they'd taken from the Bergamo house. So they've broken into these two houses in the span of a few hours, and they're not really getting... And probably don't have four or five hundred bucks between the a two big houses. Return right. for the risk. Joshua considered this a training exercise, mentoring his new friend on how to break into houses. Sunday would prove more lucrative, perhaps. So the whole goal is we're gonna ease you into burglarizing a house. I'm gonna train you best I can, show you what we do, how we act when we get in there, creep around. What to take. What what we're looking for. Yeah. How to get the hell out of there. And then we'll, you know, maybe strike it rich the next time. Now on Sunday, as I mentioned before, uh, Bill, Dr. Bill, had spent the day out in the sun. So that coupled with a hearty pasta meal that his daughter had made, he had fallen asleep on the couch with a newspaper on his chest while his wife and daughters began their show Army Wives on TV. The show ended around 11 p.m., so that's when the women locked up and went upstairs to bed. Michaela curled up in bed with her mom, Jennifer, for the evening. And as I mentioned, they were, like, reading and just hanging out. After Joshua had followed the Pettit women back home, he returned to his parents' house to feed his daughter and prepare her bath. He received a visit from a woman named Sarah that he'd met at a park the day before. After this, he pulled on a black hoodie and headed out. His mother said seeing him in the black hoodie always gave her a bad feeling. Like she knows he's up to no good. Yeah. She saw him leave. He didn't say bye. She felt like something was amiss. Man, how weird is that? To I got to go home right quick and feed my daughter and get her put to bed so I can go out and burgle. I mean, it's just weird. And I left out some details like he spoke to his underage girlfriend whose parents had moved her to like Arkansas. Basically to get her away from this pervert. And that's who he has his daughter with? No, this is a completely different 16-year-old. Jeez. Ah, so both, but his baby mom. They're both like underage girls. Okay. Way to go, Josh. Yeah. So it was around midnight that Steve Hayes, um, Stephen Hayes driving a GMC Sierra pickup truck from his mother's house in Winstead, went to the Stop and Shop store to meet Joshua. So again, they're regrouping back at this Shopping center at this huge grocery store where Joshua had spotted these two women earlier in the day. With Hayes riding shotgun, Joshua turned his venture onto Route 10 and headed north. In the back of the nondescript soccer mom van was a cache of burglary items from clothing to tools. There were also the zip ties and a few modified BB guns, items that he had picked up on Saturday, the day before. They headed to Sports Rock USA in Bristol, Connecticut, where they had a few beers. This turned into the guys drinking Southern Comfort. And around 1 a.m., they left the bar and continued driving around a bit. It was around 2.30 a.m. that the pair headed to Cheshire. As they rolled past the Pettit home, Josh informed Stephen, this is it. So this, this is, is our target. Yes. Okay. And he parks his van about six or seven houses away, 
like down the block. Wow, going out and drinking it up a little bit before you go do this doesn't seem like a good idea to me. Nothing about this seems like a good idea. Well, of course, you shouldn't break into people's houses, These period. These guys are fucking morons. But, I mean, uh, honestly, you know, some burgle, burglars do treat it like a profession, and they're kind of, you know, want to be on their P's and Look, Q's. Look, this is not the Italian job here. So these are not... These are two knuckleheads, just okay. fucking dumbasses, and on top of it, they're dangerous. So they're not world-renowned gentleman jewel thieves? No. Okay. No. We're not talking about, like, Clint Eastwood in that movie where he's, like, an art thief or whatever. So Perot would not be hunting these guys. <sighs> Through the windows of the porch area, Joshua can view Dr. Pettit... Bill, asleep on the couch. He crept through a basement door, which was locked, but Joshua was somehow able to pop it open. So once inside, he opens the door for Stephen. And while they're in the basement, Joshua grabs a Louisville Slugger baseball bat and follows the staircase up to the kitchen. Bill woke up to pain from a head injury. That's when he realized he'd been clubbed in the head with a baseball bat, which had been a giveaway from a rum brand he'd picked up in a liquor store that his father had once ran. Oh, my God. A few years earlier, Bill had been prescribed a blood thinner called uh, Coumadin. I'm sure someone will correct me on that. So as he's lying on the couch, he starts bleeding, like bleeding faster than most people because he's been hit with this bat. He, he These blows are just raining down on him, and he's just squirting blood everywhere because yeah. of this blood thinner. Oh, that's not a good recipe. No. Joshua hit the man about four or five times in the head with a bat. Using the zip ties, the two men bound Bill's feet together and then secured his hands in front of him. Joshua then demands that Bill give him the layout of the home and details about who was there. Inside Haley's room, Joshua and Stephen tied her up um, first with her hands, and then they fastened her arms and legs to the bedposts. Later, he would tell law enforcement it was Haley who had given him the most trouble struggling. She was a fighter. The men then entered into the master bedroom where Jennifer and Michaela were sleeping. The pair tied Jennifer's hands, and then Joshua led Michaela out of the bedroom. It was about 15 minutes later. The men had beaten Bill almost to death. And then they had managed to tie up everybody in the house. So just in a matter of minutes. So here, here you have a, the sleeping father downstairs, the first person they come upon. So there's really no reason they couldn't have just, uh, of course, they're just dumbass criminals. Uh, they could have subdued him and tied him up. Yeah. You didn't have to strike him in the head five or six times, right? No, you didn't have to do that. And, and that's just dumb from a, even a criminal standpoint. Now you got blood flying all over the place. It's a, causing a bit of a scene. Well, now you go from... Um, a breaking and entering. Well, that's the main to thing. To this assault with a deadly weapon. Yeah. I mean, it's just spiraling, right? These guys are not, they're not smart, Dylan. Jennifer begged Joshua not to hurt her family. Um, and at this point, like, Michaela's tied in her bed. Jennifer is tied up in the master bedroom and Haley is tied up. So they've got these three women separated and tied up in each of their beds. Joshua and Stephen take Bill to the basement at this point, and they tie him up to a support pole that's in the basement and just leave him there. And he's, at this time, I mean, he's really disoriented. He's been beaten. He's in shock. He's bleeding. Uh, feeling a little foggy-headed, dizzy, like not quite sure what's going on. My God. The men spend the next several hours ransacking the house, it's when they find a bank register showing $40,000 in an account that the men decide they want to take some of that money. Before this, Stephen Hayes would take two plastic canisters to a gas station and get $10 worth of gasoline. Obviously, gas was a lot cheaper than it is right now. Yeah, I was going to say he wouldn't get much for $10 now. He then drove back to the Pettit family home, dropped off the gas canisters, and then grab Jennifer to run their bank errand. Because by now, it's daybreak. It's it's getting near 8 a.m. They've spent a lot of time in this home. They have. Just going through everything. Stephen Hayes planned to take Jennifer to the bank and her Pacifica to withdraw money. Hayes had already taken whatever cash the couple had on hand. Jennifer's pearl necklace and even Michaela's coins. Like a coin collection she had. 
which he dropped off at his truck at the stop and shop. Jennifer agreed to take more money than they'd even asked for. She told him she would take out $15,000 from this $40,000 account. He drove her to the Bank of America branch just as it was opening for the day. He sat in the car and he was like, I'm going to have my eyes on you. If you make any moves, I've got a phone. I will call and tell my partner to kill your whole family kind of thing. So she goes inside. She fills out this withdrawal slip. On the back of the slip, Jennifer wrote a note saying that her family was being held hostage before returning to the van. She also told the teller, they seem nice. I don't think they want to hurt us, but please send help. Oh, this is like something you see in a movie. This is absolutely something you'd see in a movie. You want, once you take them from their home, it's like where you hijack the bank president, hold his family hostage so you can get in the vault. Some shit like that. I read that book. Now that was, it was a James Patterson book. <laughs> it's a it's a trope. It's been done, you know, many was, times. There was like roses are red and violets are blue, and they were like two separate books, but I think they like linked together. And so that was like the premise. If you were in Jennifer's position, could you go in that bank without trying to get help? Would you try to get help? Fuck yeah, I would try to get help. Yeah, I think you have to, right? Yeah. You can't trust these dumbasses. No. You can't trust. They've already beat your husband. You know. You got to know. Well, she doesn't even really know at this point. Well, right. What's happened to her husband. I'm sure she's freaking out because all she's seen at this point is blood. If she was able to see the sofa, that there's blood on the living, you know, on the sofa and on the living room carpet. But she doesn't even know what's happened to him at this point. Yeah, exactly. While Jennifer is at the bank with Stephen, Joshua, back at the house, begins sexually assaulting Michaela. Unfortunately, this little I, girl. I, I knew this was going to happen. This piece of shit. He then forces her to take a shower, redress, and ties her back up. Joshua also documented the encounter on his cell phone. A total of seven photos of Michaela and one photo of Jennifer are later recovered. And I won't go into detail about what those photos entailed. I'm assuming you can all use your imaginations. Haley, throughout the ordeal, attempted to escape multiple times. Joshua kept catching her trying to text with her cell phone. Then he called her again trying to call 911 and several other times trying to wrestle the restraints off. It was also reported that Haley was sexually assaulted as well by Joshua, but none of the reports or um, books, research that I did went into great detail about this. Um but it has been said that she was, it has been reported that she was also sexually assaulted. Well, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Because this guy's a fucking creep. It was around 9.21 a.m. that the bank manager called 911. The call took around four to five minutes total. It was around 9.26 a.m. that the first incident at 300 Sorghum Mill Road went across the airwaves from dispatchers. There was a second phone call placed by the bank manager to police headquarters because this bank manager is trying to call 911, trying to report this incident, and keeps getting transferred to, like, the police headquarters and then back to the 911 dispatcher and then to someone else. Come on, people. I know. I mean, it's sort of chaotic. Um, there was a total of a 19-page transcript available of this second phone call. Well, uh, okay, and to be this dev- bank manager's like I was literally on the phone for like thirty five or forty minutes. It sounds like it's such an unusual situation that the dispatchers maybe don't exactly know how to react. I mean, I guess I'll give them the benefit of a doubt on that, and they just were unsure how to proceed, and so maybe they were trying to reach upwards to their supervisor and it's like, what should we do, kind of thing. And, and unfortunately, it sounds like it, it kind of got you know. They confuse themselves trying to figure out what to do. Yeah, it totally seems like they were just ill-equipped. This was not the kind of thing that happened in this town. They didn't really know how to handle it. So again, this bank manager is just kind of being transferred all over the place. 19-page transcript released, but much of it was heavily redacted. Well, unfortunately, every time he's transferred, I'm going to guess he has to give them the story again. And they're going to have a thought of, is this even real? Or is this some kind of weird hoax, some joke, something stupid? And you have to, you know, no, this is serious. You know, he has to keep kind of going over the story over and over. That's what happens every time you get a new person on the line. It's very scary. 
It is very scary and because honestly, it's wasting time. Yes. Precious minutes. And we're not getting the resources that we need to the proper location. That's the sad part. Right? Yes. So inside the house, around 9.30 a.m., the men had no idea that law enforcement were making plans to enter the residence. And at this point, they had been inside the house for seven hours. Can you imagine this ordeal? These poor people, the, the Pettit family in this home, seven hours, tied up. They've been brutalized. I mean, honestly, who knows what really happened to these people? Yeah, even after he takes her, Jennifer, uh, what is this? Hayes, take, Stephen Hayes takes yes. Jennifer to the bank and gets, sends her in. She comes out with money, I'm assuming. They're still just like, not, you know, you think once he got back, hey, hey let's fucking go, dude. We got to get out of here. We've been here way too long. You know, I don't know if she said something in the bank. We should go. These dumbasses are still staying in the house. Yeah. So here we are seven hours later. Now, at this point, so, I mean, there's some back and forth about what transpired. Um, Stephen Hayes claims that Joshua began showing him the photos on the cell phone of what he had done while Stephen Hayes and Jennifer were gone. Like, this is what I did to the daughter. Look at her. Ooh, you know what? You should do the same thing to mom. Oh, Jesus. So, according to Stephen Hayes, at the urging of Joshua, he begins raping Jennifer. Yeah, whatever, dude. And then he strangles her and leaves her body, clothing ripped, propped up against the couch. That's when, pol that's when Hayes saw police cruisers, and he says he panicked and killed the woman. Because he s could see out the window that police were gathering outside the house. <sighs> Well, I mean, this is just a bad situation. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to work out perfect. That's for sure. Because it's not a movie. It's real life. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, you know, maybe that 30 minutes of the bank manager being, you know, transferred around. Oh, we're going to get to, there's some backlash. That means quite a bit at this point. There's definitely some public backlash. And we will get into that at the end of the case, Dylan. So by 9.55 a.m., the house is surrounded by law enforcement. The men have spread gasoline around the house and lit a match. Now, keep in mind, the girls are still tied up in their beds, and the men have placed pillowcases over their heads and have doused their linens in gasoline. Jesus. During the chaos, Bill manages to escape the home. He said he just had this sudden bolt of adrenaline, like, rush through him. He managed to get himself freed, runs to a neighbor's house. The neighbor almost didn't recognize Bill because of his injuries. And he's trying to explain, these men are in my home, you have got to call the police, you need to get help here right away. As the men um, have seen the, the police outside, the house is starting to burn, they flee. Haley and Michaela will succumb to smoke inhalation. Joshua and Stephen jump into the family's Pacifica in an attempt to escape, but they are apprehended by law enforcement immediately about a block away from the Pettit home as they crash into a barricade that's been set up. I mean, really, guys, you thought that, that this was the answer once you see cops kill everybody in the house is going to make it better? And you think you're going to get away? I mean, come on. Again, these are fucking idiots we're dealing with, Dylan. Oh my God, this is horrible. They are not criminal masterminds. And and it's sad that it had to end this way because well, yeah. these two guys are fucking idiots. Right? Yeah, it is sad. So by the time firefighters arrive on the scene, flames had engulfed the top floor of the house and inside three people are dead. The case garnered a significant amount of attention, becoming the most publicized, one of the most publicized crimes in the whole state of Connecticut. I mean, these men are immediately apprehended. And during interrogation, Commissar Jeffsky admitted to raping Michaela. Her autopsy did find evidence of semen. He claimed that he thought the girl was 14 to 16 years old. Oh, yeah, that makes it better. Yeah. It and doesn't you matter. You can look at a picture of her and you can clearly see that she is not 14 to 16 years old. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's uh, shouldn't rape any woman, let alone a kid. He's a fucking creep. He's a piece of shit. Forensic testing revealed there was also bleach on Michaela's clothing, indicating that the man may have tried to eliminate DNA evidence from the assault. 
Haley had managed to escape her restraints and run out of her bedroom and into the hallway where she collapsed and died. Because, again, she's a fighter. She's given them hell this whole time. She has multiple times attempted to escape. Use her cell phone. Call 911. She's fighting them back. And she, I mean, here it's the very end. And if she had just made it outside, like, she might have been okay. But just made it to the top hallway where she collapsed. I mean, this is so sad. It just takes a few a few gulps of that. You know, to, I'm sure the to- toxic smoke, you know, you got furnishings burning, which are highly toxic, the foam and such, highly toxic carpet. And so even in a residential home, it's quickly, it, it will take you out very quickly. So sad. She had third and fourth degree burns on her feet, showing that she had gotten close to the fire just before her death. Both men confessed to the murders. Hayes smelled strongly of gasoline during the interrogation. I mean, they were basically like, you can't even deny what you've done, dude. Like, you reek of gasoline. We know that you've set this fire. I mean, he had to admit it, right? There was no way of getting out of that. And during the interrogation, each assailant claimed that the other was responsible for the escalation of the robbery to murder. So they're just pointing the fingers at each other. And that's common. Now, Stephen Hayes did admit that he took Jennifer to the bank and then raped and killed her. Both men blamed the other for lighting the matches that started the fire. Well, yeah, because that's going to um, be the other two murders, the other two deaths attributed to the fire. So I guess in their mind, if I can get that pinned on the other guy, I'm only facing one rape and murder. I just don't even know you think like that. Hayes' trial began on September 13th of 2010. His attorney argued that Commissar Jeffsky was the mastermind to blame for the crimes It only took the jury about five hours to deliberate and reach a guilty verdict. The jury determined he should be executed on each of the six capital felony counts for which he was convicted. Yeah, I agree. Commissar Jeffsky offered to take a plea deal for a life sentence, but prosecutors wanted to take the case to trial in order to give him the death penalty. His trial began September 19th of 2011. His attorneys blamed Stephen Hayes for the murders, arguing that he had been the criminal force behind the entire incident. Yeah, I'm a typical defense. He was found guilty on October 13th of 2011. The death penalty was recommended. However, in 2015, his sentence was overturned to a life sentence. In August of 2015, Connecticut abolished the death penalty, meaning both men's sentences were commuted to life in prison. It's too good for him. Both are currently serving life sentences without the possibility of parole. I should have took them out behind the police station in the parking lot and finished pouring covering them in gas and set them ablaze. Agreed. Oh, Jesus. An uh, entire family. So poor Bill makes it out of the house to safety, right? In August of 2012, um, Dr. Pettit, or Bill as we know him, married a woman named Christina and moved to Farmington, Connecticut. In May of 2016, he announced his bid for Connecticut's 22nd House District and was elected. Wow. There are people who believe that police could have saved the three women, but they were outside setting up this perimeter. And then, of course, the information about this 35 to 40 minute call with the bank manager has caused a lot of public backlash. And there are a lot of angry folks who blame the police and are like, if you had gotten your ass in the house, like this wouldn't have happened to these people. You know, that's easy to say. But these guys were willing, once they saw the cops, it didn't change it didn't change anything for them. They lit the house on fire. And who knows when they spread that gas around. We don't know. So I, I'm just I just don't I don't know if it would have been a, a better ending if they'd kicked the door in, guns blazing. 30 minutes earlier, 45 minutes earlier, who knows? Because these morons lit the house on fire as like I thought it would be a distraction or some shit and come crashing out of the garage or some shit in the car when you're already surrounded. I mean, if they didn't have that perimeter, for all we know, these guys could have washed out into the community and ran through another family on the road trying to escape. I mean, so this... It's tricky. Well, there's always the coulda, shoulda, woulda. It's a very tricky situation. That come up and 
you know, it's easy for people to armchair quarterback what should have happened, what could have happened, what would have happened if they'd just gotten there in time. But you're right, Dylan. I mean, it's not, it doesn't look good after it's all said and done. But I, I just don't, these guys were morons. They had no, um, seeing the cops outside should slow you down. Like, oh my God, there's cops. What are we going to do? So deciding to set the house on fire and kill more people is not a good good thing, a good move in their opinion, in their case. So I just don't think it was going to end well, good. Well, I don't think it was going to end well either, Dylan, and here's why I think so. In my research, according to both Stephen and Joshua, on the Saturday evening before these murders took place, which I guess technically they took place like Monday morning, so the Saturday before, um, they had broken into the Bergamo house, and Stephen Hayes, one, they had the zip ties, which shows me that they had bad intentions tying some people up, right? And he grabbed a knife from the house. He stole a knife. Yeah. And had a knife on him. So that shows me that he had ill intentions, uh, malicious intent to hurt someone. Harm, yeah. rape, kill maybe. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, I, I mean, I just don't. I feel like he was oh itching God. to do something violent and then joshua is a burglar he's a known burglar he's done it for years I, he's just a piece of shit but on top of it he's a fucking pedophile yeah and a rapist and so yeah. is stephen hayes they're just both pieces of shit so i think you're right they had they had plans to do something terrible to this family when you have a hostage situation which is basically what the cops rolled up on it, it's so tricky it's so tricky because you can't just kick the door in, guns ablaze, and shooting everything that moves, right? You right. have to be mindful of the other occupants, the hostages, where are the good people at, who's the bad guy. We don't know, you know what I mean? You have limited information on who looks like what. So, I mean, gosh. And how often does the, this police department deal with something like this? Probably you not know? very often. So, I mean, there's just so many factors. You know, and, and to add insult to injury, Joshua had written later um, while he was in jail awaiting trial in his diary and said that Bill, was he basically was speaking very poorly about Bill and what a huge piece of shit he was that if he really cared about his family and wanted to, he could have stopped them. Yeah, oh, whatever. Yeah. Whatever, you're attacked that poor man while he's asleep. He's been... Yeah, I hear you're the fucking coward. Breaks yeah. in his house. Exactly. Slipping around in the night like some fucking cat or some shit. I don't know. You're the piece of shit. Don't you dare bring cats into this. <laughs> don't, don't you dare compare that son of a bitch to a cat. A cat burglar. I'm not even, you know what? I'm taking the kitty cat name back. Okay, Dylan. They're so cute and fuzzy. Well, now here is something, an interesting fact out of the case that I feel like could open up an interesting conversation, maybe even debate. Ooh. So we might get some folks who want to give us feedback on this part. So Stephen Hayes is now receiving hormone therapy in prison as part of a gender transition. Okay, well, that's very 2022. He I is at say. the Green State Prison in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. While he was in prison, he converted to Orthodox Judaism and sued the state for not providing what he felt like was sufficient kosher meals. Okay. Then he decided that he wanted to transition to being female and wants to be removed from the male prison to a female prison. Hmm. Do you think he's really trans? Well, he claims at 16 he was diagnosed with a sexual identity disorder and that his parents did nothing to help him. But there has been some question on whether he's trying to get transferred to a f women's prison because he's probably getting his ass kicked at the male prison. Yeah, I think he yeah, I think it's possible that he is a would rather be around women even if he's you know they're just locked up next to him, to each other. And I think that's it uh, the bigger point. He's getting his ass kicked and he won't feel so threatened, you know, in the female population. And, and I'm sorry, uh, you know, Nothing against people transitioning or trans. That's their business. But, you know, fuck this guy. Well, listen, Connecticut pays $60,600 a year for gender-affirming surgeries and hormones for the 222 state prisoners 
who identify as transgender? I don't know. I guess that could be a tricky conversation. Well, I feel like it, it's an interesting. It can open up an interesting dialogue. I'm curious to know what other people think about this. I mean, I see some points of view are like, well, it's health care. And if you're in prison, you're guaranteed health care. But then other people are like, why are my tax dollars paying for this? No. I, I'm, I don't. So I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting conversation. It is, you know, and, and I could see given basic health care. But it's like me and you discussed earlier. A lot of times your, your, your premium insurance that you pay at, through the nose for will deny medical things that your doctor uh, you know, your doctor says you need like, claim, like claim my allergy tests. Yeah. Cla- <laughs> yeah. Claiming they're so elective or, yeah. or you don't have to have that. It's not life threat and whatever dumb shit they say. And, and so I don't know. The, these are criminals, especially in this guy's case. I can't speak on the other trans, you know, gender people in, in custody, but this guy's a piece of shit. And I, for one, don't think we should be paying the extra money. And I don't give a fuck if it's for his mental health or not. Because he's a piece of shit. He murdered these people. And I don't think we should do that, personally. Because it's not... Well, you know, according to his original sentence, death. he should be executed. He should be executed. So, I don't know. I thought it was uh, interesting that this is where he's going with this now. Well, yeah, and, and for one, I don't who who even knows if he really feels that way or if he's just trying to manipulate the system to get himself in a better position. So well, that's that. what some folks seem to think is well, is that he's simply doing this in order to get out of being in this um, all male prison. And, and, and it's common. I've heard of it before for people to have this religious awakening too, and they just happen to you know, um, change to a religion that has a maybe a bit better diet than what the food they typically get. So that's a common move as well. So who knows if he really wanted to be an Orthodox Jew? Yeah, who knows? I, I don't even know what the food would look like. There was so much more about Joshua Komoserjevsky that I could have gotten into about his background. Um, he definitely had a lot of issues, and um, even from childhood there was a lot. So I would recommend for folks who want to, I guess, look more deeply into the case. So what do you um, think about? There are a couple of books. Uh, One of them I read is called In the Middle of the Night, The Shocking True Story of a Family Killed in Cold Blood by Brian McDonald. And there is another book, A Murder in Connecticut. That I read, The Shocking Crime That Destroyed a Family and United a Community by Michael Benson. And there's also an HBO documentary called The Cheshire Murders. Oh, wow. I almost watched that the other day. Yeah. So definitely uh, check those out if you would like to know more about these guys. Of course, trying to uh, condense a lot of information into a podcast episode. But there's a lot. I mean, if you wanted to kind of get into Karma Sergevsky's background, his past... You know, he, he had a a very um, troubled life. Yeah, it sounds like it. Now, what do you think about someone who says, well, so-and-so uh, talked me into doing it, like, and then all this other shit happens? And uh, do you think they have less responsibility for what happens? No, you are or- solely responsible for your own actions. And uh- I believe that... In all cases, that people need to accept personal responsibility for the choices they make. It is nobody else's fault but your own when you choose to do something. Um, I I don't have a lot of sympathy for this guy. I don't have a lot of sympathy for most people when they're like, oh, well, this and that. I'm like, you know what? You're in the position that you are in through decisions and actions that you have chosen to to take, right? You've chosen this decision, and this is the consequence. And it seems in this modern world that we live in, Dylan, in 2022, personal accountability, personal responsibility is never part of the conversation. It's always, we got to blame this or that reason. It was my childhood. I picked up that meth pipe because somebody hurt my feelings in the third grade. I mean, we hear this shit all the time. And it's like, no, you fucking chose to do that shit. Have I made bad, poor choices in my day? Yes, I have. But I accept responsibility for those choices. 
as should as should everybody else. I mean, you're in this position because you wanted to be. You wanted to break in a house. You wanted to rape and kill this woman. You wanted to light these girls on fire. This was your fucking plan. And nobody can make you do that. There was always a chance to say, you know what? I'm not comfortable with this. I don't think this is going as planned. We need to get the fuck out of here. There or, was none or, of that. Or I'm I'm going to leave and call the cops myself because I, I didn't sign on for any of this shit. No. Nah. You know, I thought it was just straight up burglary. Not that that's okay. Yeah, like, oh, I think it's it's totally acceptable that you just raped an 11 year old little girl oh here yeah show me the pictures oh you know what yeah maybe i should rape the mom now no you fucking did that shit because you wanted to do it i agree because you're a sick fucker who the fuck says that they thought the girl was 14 like that makes it okay some pervert like this dude who probably should just have his balls whacked off raping not whacked but you know cut i don't mean like somebody should jerk him off i just mean like somebody should cut his shit off like raping the mom's not okay because she's grown, but I know well, these, none of it's okay. These people don't think like that. They don't. They just do whatever they want. They were dumbasses. They had no kind of a plan. And the only good part of this story is they got caught. That's the only good part of it. Well, and then they want to boo hoo hoo about like I had a bad childhood or some shit. And it's like, well, who the fuck of us had a good childhood? You show me the person who had a good childhood, because I can guarantee you that 99% of people did not have a good childhood, but we're not out here raping and killing people. Yeah. We're not serial killers. We're not burglarizing houses, right? We're not huge pieces of shit. Uh, We might be in our own little way, but we're not doing big crimes like that. I'm not going to use my chainsaw, uh, self-inflicted chainsaw injury as a crutch. I'm surprised. Uh, you know what? My knee hurts. Why? What do you think? Do you think that that's acceptable to blame it on somebody else? No. And, and then get like a reduced sentence? No. The uh, I was going to say, on it. my only only time I would say maybe I would consider that is if someone has cognitive issues or if they're working with the, the um, you know what I mean, uh, mental disabilities yeah i know what you mean like if they're operating with a 65 iq or some shit you know what i mean right then they very well could have been not realize exactly what was happening till afterwards so that'd be the only time i would consider it in any form or fashion but you take two um whatever regular guys or whatever you want to call it um no fuck that you know he 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 wasn't even being he wasn't scared to death of this guy. He didn't think he was going to kill him either. You know what I mean? He's he's a lying bastard. Or she, whatever her pronouns are. Yeah, I'm guessing at this point it's she. Well, you know, fuck that guy. Yeah, fuck that girl. How about that? You're a piece of shit. It's a really sad case. This it's is, horrible. This is one of those stories... I remember when it made the headlines and it was in the news and it was so disturbing. Like it it has haunted me, this story. The thought of a home invasion, and we've talked about this multiple times, is so frightening. Very. Right? And then the just malevolence involved in this case. I mean, beat this man, tie his family up, spend seven hours in their home essentially just torturing them. Then you give them a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, like you go get this money out for us. And, we'll leave. and this woman is willing to do whatever it takes to protect her family, begging these men, like, please just don't hurt us. I'll, I'll give you all the money. I'll give you more than you want. I'll give you 15000 because I think they were only asking for maybe like eight or 10, something like that. I mean, she's like trying to go above and beyond to like protect her family. And she goes back with them. Yes. And then she's raped and murdered. It's oh, it's Jesus horrific. Christ. It's these men are fucking demons. I tell you your, what, knowing your kids are there. My God, it's really sad. Well, thank you for that. Though I've I've never heard that story. So really, no, I haven't. I, I'm totally unawares. Oh, okay. So that was uh, interesting. From a sadly not interesting, and uh, so here we are, and we're going to get back on the horse. We're going to get our content lined back up. So we'll be, you'll hear from us again in our midweek, right? Yes, you will. Yeah. And then on Thursday, you'll be hearing an interesting batshit crazy, right? I've only got like three in the can that we need to record. Oh my gosh. And you know what? You never know. You never know. We're feeling froggy. If we get the time, we may pop out a bonus episode where we just bullshit. 
Oh yeah. Yeah, I just made that up just now. Where where might we post this episode? Uh, shit, just post it. We'll just call it just Mountain Murders, just because. Did I just make a new podcast? I guess. Oh my gosh. It says this is, I'm an idea guy. Uh, yeah, an idea guy, but you sure as hell don't put in the work. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Heather can do it, guys and gals. We know she can. So, thank you for listening. Thanks for adding more to my plate, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you go pick those nasty scabs of yours? Oh. Uh, let's give them an email address, mountainmurderspodcast at gmail.com. If you want to reach out, give us some feedback. You have an opinion you want to share with us about today's case, we will be glad to read it. Oh, yes. We'd love to hear your feedback on the debate Heather opened up. Yeah. That's a very interesting issue to discuss. I believe so. All right. And, of course, there's always Patreon.com slash Mountain Murders Podcast where you can access bonus content, join our Discord chat, and more, Dylan. You can sponsor lots, next week's episode. Lots more. All right. For a dollar a month, you can sponsor Dylan. Yeah, and you can see all kinds of Heather on our TikTok. Yeah, we've been building that. You know, Dylan, I have to say, there's always going to be trolls. But people have been mean on there. Well, I say people. There have been like three. And they're like, her voice sucks. I don't think your and voice sucks. And I'm like, sucks. good. I hope it haunts your ears. I hope it burns your eardrums every day. <laughs> and I'm going to. my plan. I'm going to assume our listeners don't think your voice sucks and they well, love you. you know what? I can't pick my voice. That's okay. Just like, um, you know, you can pick your nose. You can pick your husband. You can pick your friends. Can't pick your nose. But you can't pick your voice <laughs> or your family, it you seems. Can't pick your nose if you don't have a good finger for it. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I know. You know what? Just bringing that up. I, I got a, I got a story. I bought my fingernails, and sometimes I wish I had a little bit of, when you get that dry booger you can't get, and I got no fingernails at all, I can't get it. So I want to see if you'll pick my nose for One me. time when I was much younger, my mom went on a vacation and came back, and it was she'd gone to the beach, and she brought me um, a gift, and I opened it. She had wrapped it. My mom was, she's mean, man. She did all sorts of terrible things to me as a kid. I unwrapped this gift, and it was a crab claw. Nice. And she told me it was a booger snatcher. <laughs> That's awesome. No, it was not. Oh, it's like when you watered the rock for a year thinking it was a dinosaur egg. You know what? Stop. <laughs> okay. All right. We hope everyone has a, a great day and a great week, and we will catch you later. Bye.